Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 194. How to stop feeling overwhelmed. How fantastic are these requests? This request comes from Adam. And Adam, as promised, I'll show you tips and tricks, ways to intervene today and tomorrow and next week and next year to stop that sense of being overwhelmed. So I will do that for you. But before I go there, I do want to take a big step back and explore why you, yes you, in international higher education and particularly in a doctoral program, why you are feeling overwhelmed. And the answer is that the current university system and indeed the current workplace requires that you feel overwhelmed. <laughs> Let me explain. I want to look at the development of a concept. What I love doing in these vlogs, and I don't do enough, and I will do, I think, this a lot more in the year to come, but it's always my pleasure to talk about a brand new innovative idea that's emerged from some of the most innovative scholars in the world, and today I'm doing one of those concepts and talking about this innovative research. And this concept that I'm going to talk about today, harm, uh, emerged from what I believe is the greatest book published in the 2010s. And look, I'm recording this in December 2019, though I reckon I can call it from here. So this book is titled Deviant Leisure, Criminological Perspectives on Leisure and Harm, just published, edited by Thomas Raymond and Oliver Smith. Tom, Oliver, two of the greatest emerging scholars in the world follow these men's careers. They are inspirational and they're doing amazing research. Okay, now each chapter in this remarkable edited collection, Deviant Leisure, is transformative for an array of disciplines. And in fact, I'm working on six separate projects that are gonna be published next year very different projects, as you may expect from me, but this book is going to be used in all of those six projects, so I really recommend it to you. But you may be asking, well, Tara, okay, Deviant Leisure, there's a book from Leisure Studies. What remotely has that got to do with me in a PhD program in a university and my sense of being overwhelmed? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Tom and Oliver have developed a new theory of harm, harm. And they ask, what is bringing harm to our lives? Now, classical criminology, bless, yes, there are still people out there doing that. It focused on how individuals lose self-control, often men of a particular class, bless. And so those individual men lose control and then they do stuff with guns or knives or violence on the street and so forth. Less. Good luck with that. But the radical change that has emerged to this model of criminology comes from ultra-realist criminology. Again, some of the most brilliant ideas on this planet right now, today, yesterday, is happening through ultra-realist criminology. With my respects to Simon Winlow and Steve Hall. Gentlemen, you are changing the world. Thank you for what you do for all of us. And what these gentlemen show is the crime that exists within capitalist structures. So this is not about individuals' responses to social events or a context. It's not about some sort of reified understanding of an inequality. Instead, this explores the crimogenetic environment in which all of us work, conduct leisure, raise families, and yes, go to university. And this modelling, this theory is producing some stunning and startling consequences and results and outcomes. So what we have here is a new theory of harm, which is so useful to how we can think about the contemporary university environment. Now, I think I'm the first person to say this theory from criminology and leisure studies I really want to make this work in higher education studies. I really want to make it work in educational theory. Now, I'm really the first person to try and slam those ideas together, as I always do. There's a lot of tough intellectual work that I have to do, particularly in the political economy in the next couple of months, but I'm going to do that work. It is going to operate. It is going to move, but I have to do the work 
rather than assume the work like I tell all of you. But what I want to do is I want to channel this spark of innovation in the vlog. Here is this fantastic concept that is transforming international knowledge. Wow. And so therefore what I want to do is take that concept and explore how to mitigate harm in the contemporary university system to stop you feeling, yes, you've guessed it, overwhelmed. Now, the first thing I'd say is it's not about you. It's not you. It's actually not your fault that you're feeling overwhelmed. The point of the contemporary university system <laughs> is to make you feel overwhelmed. That's the point of the system. It's not an outcome of your stressful life. Being overwhelmed is the point of the system. If you think about it, there are so many circulating narratives in our lives about what it means to have a good life. And you might like to think about it. What does that mean for you? And for most people in our culture, to have a good life is to be free in some form, to have choices and have some agency and also some free time outside of paid work. That's sort of the narrative that's encouraged in our culture. But as you can see, if that's the narrative, then a lot of stuff is seriously going wrong there. And we've got proxies for that wrongness. And that would be, say, the complete irrationality that's occurring in our political systems at the moment. I don't even have to go further into that. It's like, what is happening? I do not understand what is occurring. So the weird stuff that's happening in formal politics. But also mental health challenges. All sorts of very complicated mental health concerns are emerging in very unusual spaces in our culture. And also credit card debt, just to use one other model. So the debt culture that exists. If you haven't got the money, why are you spending it? And if you know you haven't got the money, why are you continuing to spend it? So what's going on with the debt culture? So as you can see, really irrational stuff is going on. So we live in societies now that are currently rendering a series of harms to us, to individuals, to families, to cities, to workplaces, to rural environments. Hi, Catherine. And all these harms are circulating in our culture. Climate change is an obvious one, but there's plenty of them. All these harms are circulating in our culture and they're sort of legalised and we're normalising them. So Tom and Oliver described this as, quote, a sense of lack, fragile narcissism, fragile narcissism, and a fear of missing out, end of quote. That really captures our current life, doesn't it? There it is. And of course, all of those variables result in profound mental health concerns, ontological insecurity, and also anxiety. So in a PhD program, you are the most brilliant people that exist in our culture. That's why you're here. You are brilliant, brilliant people. And you have bought into the narrative that if you work hard, because of course you've sacrificed, you've been good at school, good at university, and you've gone into a degree. So you've been a good person. You've worked incredibly hard to be here. And you've bought into that narrative that if you work hard, you will be successful and happy. <laughs> And of course, our culture absolutely disproves that on a daily basis. So you've worked hard and you're not successful. You've worked hard and you're not happy. So what then occurs? Well, all sorts of quite problematic emotional states emerge where you blame others, ridicule, anxiety, stress, jealousy, envy. You can just keep going on, basically. So what happens in these types of ages? is your identity markers are disordered. You feel doubt, you feel a lack. And further, you get sort of this weird situation going on where you think everybody is happier and, and smarter and more successful than you. Now, under Fordism, that is a model of industrial capitalism, it was much better organised in many ways between work and leisure. So you would work during the working week. Do you remember these phrases? Work during the working week and on the weekend you would have leisure time. And in the 19th century that was referred to as recreation. To recreate yourself for work. All going well. Then of course we hit post-Fordism. Bless. And the expansion of the white collar workforce in particular. So then all really sort of irrational bonkers stuff started to emerge, like team building exercises. 
after dinner drinks, um, casual Fridays. And then of course you've got social media that's particularly geared for the workplace where you've got LinkedIn. So post the mobile phone, work has now permeated every nook and cranny of your entire life. So the work and leisure binary opposition has dissolved. Work now is everything. So this is now the positioning that our ultra realist criminology colleagues would say that we're now all engaging in highly irrational behaviours. We're for example continuing to engage with consumer culture even though we know that it harms ourselves, it harms our friends, it harms other people, it harms the environment. We know that and we keep doing it. So we are continually masking this self-harm because we supposedly still, through that narrative, believe in freedom and we believe in individuality even if the only freedom we have is the choice between will I wear that blue top or will I wear that black top? Mm, let me think, what brooch will I select today? These choices mean a great deal. So of course choice through shopping, but also, you know, what am I going to have for dinner? So all these tiny choices sort of reinforce, oh yes, I'm in control of my life. Darling, you've chosen a brooch. You're eating a banana. They're not important life choices. And because these scale of choices are harming us, our life is oriented for display. Defining who we are by what we own. So our entire lives are now commodified and harm is now embedded in our daily social processes, resulting in hyperconformity and endless cycles of disappointment. We've become what Simon Winlow has described as, quote, the traumatised subject, end of quote. Head explosion. There's a, there's a whole career that could be engaged with that particular concept, that particular phrase, crucial. So this is a remarkable theoretical intervention, really. It provides a context around why you are feeling overwhelmed. So everything starts with your understanding of what is a good life. So you're oversubscribed, you're overscheduled, you're confusing the urgent and the important, and you care what other people think about you, when those people probably don't even know your name. And you're becoming reliant on the views of others. You're feeling inadequate, you're feeling trapped, and yes, you're feeling like you're missing out. Actually, no one can do it all. Todd, that was our conversation, do you remember? No one can do it all. And just because something can be done faster, doesn't mean doing it faster is actually better. Some of the best managers and leaders I see in the world don't just continually do things faster. They stop and they go, do I actually need to do this thing in the first place? And also being busy is not a virtue. I know people, wonderful students say to me all the time, oh Tara, I know you're busy. And I say, I'm not busy at all. I'm going to a meeting, but don't confuse going to a meeting with being busy. They're very different things. So the key question to initiate this conversation is what do you value? What is of value to you? And you've got to be honest here, sort of, you know, is it your stuff? Do you like your stuff? I love stuff. Stuff. Does your stuff make you feel valuable? Is it about the people around you and what they think of you? Because what actually happens is through those modes, you're giving your power away. You're giving your power away to the contents of a shopping bag. You're giving your power away to other people who probably don't know or care if you're alive or dead. So this is not gonna go well. So therefore, as promised Adam, here are eight strategies that you can implement today, that you can implement tomorrow morning to reorder yourself, to stop that sensation of being overwhelmed. And the happy byproduct of this is you'll start to create a bit of space, a bit of time to think, and an opportunity to recognize what is valuable to you. Okay, here we go. Tip one, <laughs> pay yourself first. This is my greatest tip ever in the history of the universe. So the reason I am sane, well, relatively sane, 
And the reason why I look I'm satisfied with my life, everything's cool. Every day I'm feeling pretty good. Now, why am I like that? Because like most people go, this is a bit of a, a bonkers life. And actually, no, I'm, I'm good. Winning, feeling pretty good. And the reason I'm centered and balanced in a relatively chaotic job and life has one cause, one. I pay myself first. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I wake up in the morning, as you know, pretty early, and I wake up in the morning and I do my research, my reading, and my writing first. I never allow other people to steal, appropriate, or encroach on the first two hours of my day. So wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, whatever job, I pay myself first. And that allows me, of course, to relax because I'm continually learning, I'm filling up my well. Oh, gee, that's interesting. So I'm excited by learning, filling up my well, emotionally feeling quite good and calm because I'm doing stuff that I enjoy. And therefore, I can arrive at work on a job like this. And of course, I'm in a job which is about serving others. That's what this job is. It's a service job. So that means my well, well is full. I'm feeling good. I've done my business. I've paid myself first. So then when I come into this office, I can focus on you and I can focus on what you need rather than sort of self-worry and all this sort of do this stuff about myself. My, me, I'm cool. Paid myself first, rocking. What can I do for you? So I pay myself first. <laughs> Tip two, <sighs> manage your emails with the focus of a guard dog patrolling a drug den. Now, this is really interesting. Some fascinating studies, and it's study after study after study, by the way, over about 20 years now. The characteristic of people that show high anxiety and high stress is that they go to their emails first thing in the morning. So you wake up, go to your email, wake up, email, wake up, email, wake up, email. Wow. Now, this, of course, is the path to madness. Similarly, the people who decide, wow, that they're going to answer their emails and get the notifications to their mobile phone, just in case two screens are not enough, let's have multiple screens and multiple email interfaces. That's just tremendous. So, of course, then, of course, they never put it on silent. So you get every single ping of every single email. And, of course, what happens? And it happens to the rest of us who are in meetings with them as well. So you know, either the thing like, or you know, it makes a noise on the desk, you know, those people, because um, it's on silent and, yeah, isn't that going well? Or it pings. So they're endlessly, the first thing they do is they look down. So they're removed from their current job and they sort of look at that, glance at that, get a bit stressed, get a bit worried, and then sort of try and regroup and move back to their present age. Now, of course, this you can see, I mean, I'm getting agitated, worried about it, right? So if that's you, and I'm sure it's a lot of you because this is a real problem, okay? Then the answer is a simple one. And it's called the calm inbox. So, firstly, never, never, never look at your emails first thing in the morning. Stop it. Two, never treat your emails like a drip, 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 so you're getting them all through the day, every day, on the weekends, wherever you are. Instead, go to your emails during a planned moment of your day. Now, of course, you have to reduce the quantity of the emails, which is a great thing to do anyway. So, for example, unsubscribe from all those stupid marketing emails, like you bought flowers in 2006 for your mum, and they're still sending you the marketing emails, like unsubscribe team. And secondly, when you're replying to an email, do us all a favour and don't CC it to half of South Australia. So don't allow your psychosis with emails to actually make other people's emails worse. So stop that. And then every morning when you, or afternoon, whenever you decide you're doing it, go through your emails and bef before you've even opened one, look at the subject headings. And if it's just nonsense, and a lot of emails are, just, just delete it from the subject heading. So go through, do a, do a, I'll go through first, you go boof, 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 delete, delete, thanks for playing. And then for the update emails, so someone go, oh, Tara, just make sure you know about this. When I read it, go, thank you very much, out. So short answers to the updates. And what that then means is for the actually important emails, and there are important and significant emails, you see them 
and you can spend time and focus engaging with those emails. And I think we need to remember emails are asynchronous communication. They're not meant to be like a human dialogue. They're asynchronous. They arrive, you can have a think, have a reflection and reply. Now, if people in your life send emails at 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. or 11 p.m. or 11 a.m., you know, the really the people that sort of decide, I'm going to show you how hard I'm working, so I'm going to send an email at 1 a.m. You know those people? You know those people? We all do. That's their psychosis. It's not yours. Let it go. Don't be drawn to their madness, because that's how you end up overwhelmed. So, nice, calm inbox and run your emails during a conventional working day. Now, three, <laughs> put your mobile phone in your bag. I mean it, put your mobile phone in your bag. Do not leave it on your desk. And I know you do this, I'm looking at you, I know you do this. Overwhelmed people, have multiple screens in their lives. They're like a pinball. They're bouncing between all the multiple screens in their lives. And of course, all of these screens are active concurrently and yes, at the same time. So look, you're not a drug dealer, unless you are and good luck with that, but you are not a drug dealer. You do not have to be available immediately, full stop. Now, if you have kids and relationships and all that sort of stuff, that's fine. So look at your phone every 30 minutes. Do it in an ordered fashion. Now, and I'll be really brutally frank here, do you really think that you're that important? That people need to be in touch with you more than at 30 minute increments? I don't even have my mobile phone at work. I'm completely unimportant. I don't matter at all. No one needs to contact me at all. That's why I just don't have a mobile phone with me. So you've really got to ask yourself, in your head, do you think you're that important, that you know, like the President of the United States, that people need to contact you immediately? Do you really think that? Maybe time to recalibrate a little bit. Maybe there is a value in focusing on your corporeal reality, the reality where your body is at a particular time than where your screen is pulling you to be. So emphasize the problem, the issue, the opportunity in front of you. Start with that opportunity or problem and finish with that opportunity or problem, then move to the next thing. Now, of course, you are going to feel overwhelmed when your computer is endlessly beeping the arrival of emails. By the way, I turn my email sound down, so you just get rid of the beep, because the beep is the path to madness, right? Um, your phone is pinging, Facebook notifications, Twitter stuff, I mean, wow. Bang, 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 bang. Of course you're going to be a bit agitated. So turn off the sound in all your devices. Focus on a single task where your body is. Focus on the task in front of your body and then finish it. And then put your phone in your bag and pull it out very occasionally. Now, if this is a problem for you, so what I've just said to you is like I'm speaking a foreign language. Like I've just literally cut off like a, a few fingers of your hand, maybe your entire like arm, I've just cut off. If you're one of those people who go, Ta, I can't do that. I do recommend, look an interesting book written by Catherine Price called How to Break Up with Your Phone. <laughs> and look, it actually is a pretty good book and provides a strategy for you to do it, you and your partner to do it, you and your kids to do it. So it actually creates a good household if this is something you think you need to do. Okay, which leads to four. Control your use of social media. Why FOMO? Fear of missing out. FOMO <laughs> um, is the framework that creates your sense of being overwhelmed. It is the frame. You're overwhelmed because of FOMO. Dude, our culture is based on this hyper involvement and oversharing. Why else do people photograph their food? Why do I want to see what you're eating? Really, oversharing team, calm the farm. With everyone oversharing so much in our lives, and of course always other people's lives look so much better than yours, <laughs> uh, you're getting overwhelmed. But what I'd suggest is use social media in a different way. 
stop the notifications they always say so stop the ping 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 stop that use it as leisure so make a decision to go to it and you know if your friends have had a great success if their life is going well be be happy for them that's they're your friends something great's happened to them that's don't do the FOMO thing it's like wow that is an amazing achievement I am so happy for you similarly use it professionally to share your work so this article has just appeared let me share this in a predictable and rational way on Twitter so that's how you use it you're not going to miss out on anything you know what just occupy your life occupy your time open your eyes and look around you don't be the guest star of your own life be the star of your own life and as I've always said hundreds of times in these vlogs success is not a finite resource you can be successful and you can be successful and you can be successful it is like Oprah with the cars feel excitement for the triumphs of other people that doesn't take anything from you they've had a great run tell them that's absolutely brilliant because it is and similarly when you work hard to create your own successes tell people about it and they too will create this community of support five don't confuse the urgent with the important this is not about you and this is not your fault we live in a time of accelerated modernity as my beloved late husband Steve used to say we live in quote a city of the instant end of quote what's happened is our clocks have been hollowed out and what it's leaving now is this toxic damaging never-ending now but the urgent most of the time is not important and I think it is emails that created that confusion between the urgent and the important now I've seen so many supervisors so many supervisors send an email at 11 p.m. and be disappointed in the lab the next morning when the student hasn't responded to that email at 9 a.m. Similarly, I have students, not only students that I see at Flinders University, my own students through my career, where they send, and this is so common, I just, I just remember getting teary, uh, they send a draft to a supervisor the night before and they're just sort of a bit disappointed when we haven't read it by the 11 o'clock meeting. It's time, team, that we slow our clocks down a bit. But also we need to simply remove the nonsense from our lives. So all of us need to actually smash cut out the bonkers, the weird, the pointless, the irrelevant stuff in our lives. Great tactics I always use. I say no a lot. You gotta do this? Yeah, no. no. Uh, and I always use no early. So like if you go, will, will you do this next September? No. No. So use no a lot and use early no's. That's a great way to start to get control of your life. So if something bonkers is happening, you don't have to feed into that bonkerness. You just go, nah, <laughs> bonkers, boy. Um, so call it early and just get the bonkers weird stuff out of your life. And when that pointless stuff has dropped away, the important stuff will remain. And you can then address that with care and with integrity. Six crucial one give yourself small definitive deadlines and meet them all of us are overwhelmed when we think of all of the stuff that's left to do that's a natural normal response and of course in a PhD the thesis is too big to even be comprehensible so when you're using language like I've got to finish this thesis I'm getting worried and anxious for you I've got to finish the thesis, I've got to finish the thesis. It's, it's too big to even get your brain around. So you're going to be overwhelmed. So what we need to do is configure finite tasks that begin and end. So, as we often said, and this has been a really successful strategy, I know a lot of you out there have tried this and you've written your thesis this way, so I'm grateful one of these tips work, but write 250 words a day. How do you finish your PhD? You write 250 words a day read an article a day, draft a section of a chapter, add 20 references to EndNote, run some samples. The way to avoid being overwhelmed is to name and log those tasks and finish them. So if your task is finish your PhD, that's going to make you feel overwhelmed. If your task is write 250 words, we're golden. 
Seven, control what you can control. It is important that none of us live our lives as hostages to the people around us. Look, I understand if you're in a relationship, if you have kids, absolutely, quite rightly, primary socialization, those relationships must be the number one priority of your life. No doubt about that, not even questioning that. But how often are you frustrated or bossed about that people don't matter at all? So people that actually don't matter at all and you're getting all anxious and worked up about what they said. You're overwhelmed because this person over there said that they would do this and they haven't. Well, that person over there said that they would meet you and they arrived an hour late. <laughs> not your monkey, not your circus. Wish people well with their decisions, but make sure every day that you have a series of tasks that are completely in your control. So I have to wait for people a lot. So I also always in my bag have five tasks that are absolutely mine to do, often on paper, so I'm not relying on Wi-Fi, so I can sit and wait for people and do work. And so I'm not bothered, there's no dead time. If they don't turn up, it doesn't matter because I'm finishing a job. What can you control? So other people may help you or they may not but your success must not be reliant on other people's behavior. And that's how you get overwhelmed. Eight, last one, forgive yourself. I'm always stunned that PhD students are so hard on themselves. Trust me, you're hard on us sometimes too, you're hard on the rest of us, but you're also incredibly hard on yourselves. And these self judgments summon this harm culture. And of course it depletes you, it makes you feel a bit incompetent. I understand that. And look, life is pretty dreadful most of the time. You know, I never lie to you, I don't pretty this stuff up. I've got a very good sense about the contemporary workplace. I know what's going on, I know what's happening in publishing, I know about teaching. I get universities, I really do, it's my workplace. And look, life is pretty dreadful most of the time and survival is often an achievement. So how do we handle that? create small tasks, finish those tasks and always pay yourself first. And if stuff goes wrong during the day, forgive yourself and know that tomorrow morning you can wake up and yes, pay yourself first. Thank you Adam. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.